This is Duke University. Bit brief and I may skip over some slides. Um, uh, I titled this talk Can Dismal Science Promote Social Enterprise because I, I'm not really, um, I'm not part of CASE. Um, I'm not a social entrepreneur. Well, I, I, no, 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 no. No, well. Okay, okay. Well, I, what I, no, what I mean is, what I mean is that I don't come from the background of social enterprise. I come from a much more mainstream financial economics world. And through, because Paul and Kathy and Greg have been really generous with their time, they've gotten me excited about a, a set of research questions that really link corporate finance and entrepreneurial finance to social enterprise. And what I'm going to try to do is maybe just kind of give a very high level overview of some of the research that, that I'm excited about now and then I think that'll dovetail into, into um, Pramal's talk. So, um, you know, like I said, I'm kind of a plain vanilla corporate finance guy and so um, this is kind of how I was used to thinking about the world. You've got limited partners, you've got a venture capital firm, the, lim the venture capital firm takes the money from the limited partners, invests it, provides expertise, along with that investment and hopes to generate returns that it then turns back to the limited partners. And you know, the world of academic finance has spent the last 20 years trying to understand a variety of problems that, uh, that, that kind of fit into this picture somewhere. And you know, and then I started talking to, to Greg and to Kathy and to Paul and I realized you know, there's a very close analogy here to part of what's going on in social enterprise where you have you know, organizations like social venture capital funds that are in some ways doing very similar things. The big difference is that the organizations that they're investing in, um, there's a financial component to what they're doing, but there's also a social component to what they're doing. And so really, um, you know, if you want to think about what's made entrepreneurship in the U.S. grow tremendously over the last, let's just say, 40 years, for, for, for lack of a better number, uh, it's been the growth of the, inter of the sector that intermediates investment in entrepreneurship. And so it struck me that if you, like one of the big challenges to promoting social enterprise is really promote, promoting the size, doing things that would scale the size of, this, of the social financial intermediation sector. And, and, and I'm trying to think about some questions related to that. So I think, you know, can, can traditional financial economists do anything to help scale social enterprise? Well, I think if we can maybe provide answers to two broad questions, maybe the answer is yes. And, and one question is, what, what are the impediments to scaling the size of the intermediation sector? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. And the other is, how can the forces of competition be harnessed to accelerate the growth of the sector? And so I guess really what I'm trying to do here is just create more social middlemen. Now middlemen, so I guess what we want to do is kind of grow to a world that looks more like this, where there's a very, I mean, and we're already in this world in some ways. The question is, can we make this world a lot bigger? A world where there's a lot of different types of players providing capital to a lot of different types of organizations, each with its own strength, uh, you know, dividing up the market in different ways. Middlemen are nothing new. And in fact, you can go back to Adam Smith and find examples in The Wealth of Nations where he talks about one of the fundamental causes of famine in Edwardian England was the fact that they, there were prohibitions against trading corn. So because there was no, no intermediary that could take the corn output created by the farmer and, and put it into the, into, the, into the stalls where it was sold, you had, you had periodic isolated famines and there was no mechanism for resolving that until they banned co uh, prohibitions against uh, trade in corn. You can fast forward a couple hundred years and you know Amartya Sen won the Nobel Prize in large part for understanding that that, that poverty, I'm sorry, that famine is, is not so much caused by food shortages. 
it's caused by the inability to intermediate food. It's, in other words, you've got food in one place and you've got people who need it, and the intermediation sector completely breaks down. And so food sits and rots while poor people who don't have access to the food can't get it. Right? So the idea that promoting intermediation as a way of generating better outcomes on the ground sort of at the delivery level is actually a very old idea. I don't think there's anything new in what I'm having to say. But the question is, what are the, what are the big impediments to scaling this sector? And as I view it, there, there, there are three major impediments. And the first is data. And that's kind of the, the, kind of the top of the sieve. And from data, all other things flow. But I see, I see the, the fundamental challenges in getting better data, creating more transparency, and, uh, and creating a system where you can make comparisons across alternative investments better. With better data, I think you can make better governance decisions and better compensation decisions. Now, this is a problem. The, the, you could use just as well say that data, governance, and compensation are three challenges that we face in the commercial uh, entrepreneurship sector. And indeed, I think that's true. The, the, the trick here, though, is that measurement is so much more difficult that, you, uh, that the data challenge is hard, but also there, there, there are important interactions between, between these. So what do I mean by data? I think that, I think that, that one of the things that we can do as, as academics to kind of help promote the scale of the social intermediation sector is we can provide more data of, uh, of two types. The first type is what you might call just standard program evaluations. And we've made tremendous progress in this area over the last 15 years. And basically, a lot of the program ev evaluation literature works off of the idea that programs get oversubscribed. And so you can take some people who, who you can take the many, many people who want to participate, and you can randomly allocate some to the program and keep some away. And through that, you can measure the efficacy of the program. And by demonstrating the program's efficacy, you can really send a clear signal to investors that there is value for your money in this enterprise. And if you care about this social output, then here is proof that we are delivering that social output, and therefore you should put your money behind it. And one of the complaints that I hear when I talk to social entrepreneurs is that social entrepreneurs are busy, and they're impatient, and they want results. And they don't like the standard, the burden of proof that you often have to, to wield in, in scientific circles. But I think there's, I think there's actually scope for, I think there's actually a, a, a very comfortable middle ground here where you can use the methodology of program evaluation. But instead of, decide, instead of saying, okay, we're not gonna say that this program works unless we hit this draconian standard of proof, we can ease off and go towards much more of what you might call um, you know, business judgment principles. And is that my cue that my time's up? <laughs> no. And I think with that, we can, re we can be in a world where we can have statistically rigorous discussions about whether a program is actually working. And at the same time, um, we, we can have actionable data that results from this. So instead of having to run, run a project for years and years in order to accumulate enough data to make a very strong statistical statement, you can use the standard of business judgment, which just says, is this more likely or not to work, have a much smaller sample, have a much cheaper measurement protocol, and get answers that can be operationalized much more quickly. So I think that's one area where we can add a lot. I think the second area is in terms of just administrative or accounting data, just what you might call just HR data or, or income statement data. And you know, the, the, what is the first thing you do when you're, when you're trying to talk to somebody about a business model in the entrepreneurial sector, the, the commercial sector? You want to know what their, what their business model is, and you kind of mentally walk through what an income statement looks like. The more accounting data we have that captures social and financial trade-offs, the, we, the, uh, the better position we're going to be in to 
think as intermediaries about how to allocate investments across alternative uh, organizations. Now, I think, you know, from, from once you have better data, then I think <laughs> governance and compensation outcomes follow immediately. Because as soon as you can describe what's happening, then you can make comparisons between alternatives. And as soon as you can make comparisons between alternatives, you can allocate capital and you can allocate resources in a, privileged man in a manner that privileges that which is improving over that which is not. So I think what's the big outcome that would arise from, suppose we had a lot more data and a lot more measurement tools and a lot more program evaluations in this space. And suppose with that data we had a much larger social financial intermediation sector. What would be the big outcome? What would be the deliverable that you would get from having that? Well, I think one of the big outcomes is that you would be able to dis decouple the, 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 the scale of an organization from the scale of social impact. So in other words, there are, world, there, are, there, are, there are problems in the world where the size, of the, the size of the social entrepreneur is sort of proportional to the size of the problem they're trying to solve. And it makes sense to grow the organization to solve the problem. You can also imagine a different world where the problem is far too big and far too multifaceted for any one organization to achieve the scale to solve the whole problem. And so what you want to do is you want to have, you want to have lots of small organizations each solving a, a piece of the problem. Here we've decoupled the scale of the social mission from the scale of the entrepreneur that's attacking the mission. And I think when you grow the, the size of this market, then you enable that to happen. Now, how do you enable that to happen? Well, one, you're just increasing the amount of money that's going into this sector. And so you're, 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 re, you're relaxing the resource constraint that these uh, organizations face. But also, and, and this is where I'm really, really excited to hear what you're going to have to say, because w the other thing that you do is you create scope for heterogeneity here. You can have different types of organizations that have their own different business models. And with that, you can, their mission will be tailored to certain types of, of organizations over others. So, Two other things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Pramal. Two other things that I, want, that, that I think we could get, what, what's the, the big prize here? In some ways is that you could, you, could, you, could get, you could understand what was the social cost of capital. And so we think about publicly traded organ, firms in the world who have a cost of capital. And that reflects how much they, that tells them how much they have to pay investors to take on the risk of investing in their organization. So if you think about earning financial returns here along this, so, so a firm out here has a very high financial return. A firm here has a low financial return. You think about this axis telling you about social returns. So a firm here has a high social return. A firm here has a low social return. And if you want to think uh, to, to, to Greg and Kathy's discussion this morning about business models, well, maybe social enterprises, maybe different business models that attack a problem in a certain social sphere can be described as sort of points along this line. They're trade-offs between having more social output uh, but at greater financial expense, or maybe having less of, a less of an immediate social output but at a, a more sustainable level of operations. So what does a sustainability line look like? It looks like just a straight line that says, you're breaking even here. So viable businesses would be anybody in here. The more data, if we had data that actually allowed us to make trade-offs uh, between financing, uh, financial returns and social returns, then we could change the, the cost of capital from being something that was more or less a break-even analysis to something where we were looking at trade-offs between the best social alternative, the best financial alternative, as defining essentially the, the viable, viable uh, social business models. 
So what, what would that do? That would shut down a lot of, that would shut down a lot of, that would, <laughs> speaking of shutting down, The world of break-even investment is going to fund a lot of businesses that maybe don't have very large social impact but are financially sustainable. If we had enough data to understand the trade-offs between social returns and financial returns better, we would shut down these businesses even though they, op even though they were break-even. And instead, we would privilege businesses like this over them. These are businesses that, that do not break even. But they give you a better, but they give you better value for money in terms of what the alternatives are in either the purely social or purely financial world. Now that's kind of my pie in the sky dream of what I would do if I had the data that we're talking about. Um, thankfully, we're already doing this, and so you know, Case is involved in a lot of the initiatives that are out there trying to collect data to to, to be able to speak to the efficiency of social enterprise. I was going to try to talk to you about competition, but <laughs> it turns out that the math gets pretty hard pretty fast. And I was, you know, I had far too many X's and, uh, to, to, to really say anything. So I'll just conclude by, um, yeah, I, I was happy to put that down. Listen, uh, um, I, think that, I think that the best way that financial markets can, can increase social enterprise is by increasing the, the size of the social financial intermediation sector. And I think the key sort of in order of importance, the, the key main impediments to, to that are data, governance, and compensation. And I think if we had better intermediation, we could, we could sort of break the link between firm size and mission size, and we could also break the link between immediate financial viability and longer run. Uh, social payoff. So I guess the good news is is that we're already working, we're already making a lot of progress on uh, on exactly these problems. And so with that, I guess I'll turn it over to you. You can leave that up. Can you leave that up, actually? I know. I want to, you want to leave yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I want to... Um, you can just click on Firefox. Okay, great. All right, so Professor Robinson's uh, slide right here, I think is awesome. So I just want to pick up. Can you guys see that okay? So I think um, one of the big questions that I have is, um, you know, we talked about firms. I, I would say Kiva right now might be known as a company that is somewhat in this space. So the attributes of Kiva that um, you know a lot of people see are, wow, it's, it seems to be scaling. Um, and it's you know the internet community. They basically, um, they're when they make a loan, they don't get a rate of return back, but they hardly ever lose their money. On 165 million dollars that's been lent on our website, um, there's been a two percent loss rate. Um, so it's in this kind of not quite a donation, not quite commercial return space. That's that's um, what Kiva is playing in, and we like to think of it as connected capital. Um, and one of the one of the one of the things that um, I'm coming to learn is, um, I would say there's two things. The first is I actually think that thinking about this problem two two dimensionally um, um, might not fully describe the world. Um, the big learning now uh, for me is if this is your social return on investment and this is your financial return, right? Um, and then let's say at z right here would be 0% IRR. Donations would be over here at negative, right? And up here, there's some kind of right now that there's no real standard system on social impact. But let's say we could actually come up with one. I think there's a third dimension, um, which is actually how connected I feel to that thing. So what I'm seeing on the Kiva platform is that the internet community is not necessarily saying, OK, what's the probability of me getting my money back? if I lend to this entrepreneur in Liberia or Iraq, which might be more risky than if I lend to this entrepreneur in Peru or Bolivia, more mature market finance markets. Nor am I seeing the internet community always being hyper, I would say, rational around impact. Because there is no like, standard for impact measurement on the Kiva platform today. Um, and it's largely missing, I think, as, as a standard in philanthropy, right? Oh, so. 
So one thing I'm seeing is that people tend to invest along where they feel most connected or their affinity, which seems to me um, could be a challenge essentially because it might mean that um, what Kiva lenders are doing is not always the most socially optimal thing. So that's, that's I think, one of the problems that we face, and which is why we need to figure out standards around social impact so that we can at least put this data on our platform so people can make more informed choice. Um, because otherwise, then, me coming to the site, I'm going to prefer lending to someone in India because of my heritage, even though the, the greatest social impact might be somewhere else. Um, that's one thing I want to say. The other thing, though, that we are seeing is that Kiva, um, Kiva lenders essentially seem to be very risk tolerant, if not risk seeking. So some of the places that get funded the fastest when an entrepreneur profile is posted up is in the highest risk places like Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and so what that's allowed us to do is um, actually go into places where commercial capital is not flowing. And I think this is really something that we want to explore more. So for example, in post-conflict Africa, um, you know, there's this common cycle where, um, after, you know, there, there's civil strife, then uh, aid or uh, relief organizations will come in. They'll be there for maybe three to five to seven years. Then that will dry up. Essentially, if the institutions aren't strengthened to a certain place and the kind of economy is not um, at a certain, you know, level of strength, the probability of that civil strife reemerging, you know, happens again. And there seems to be a cycle sometimes. So one of the things that we're trying to do is actually target the internet community's capital because they're willing to take more risk because it's based on empathy versus a bank when they lend. It's based on you know kind of what shareholder return requirements are. Um, uh, and there's so much risk distribution on the platform because people are going in in $25 increments. We're trying to actually fund organizations that can't get funding from the commercial sectors. So today, after five years on Kivo, we now fund more microfinance institutions in post-conflict Africa than any other funder worldwide. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and what's really exciting is, uh, so we're in, you know, um, this organization that um, we've been working with for the last 18 months in Sierra Leone, we now have gotten them to a point where, let me show this organization on our website here. So I'll go back and do kind of just a, a Kiva 101 thing. But um, one thing I'm really, really excited about is this potential, where essentially, so today there's, you know, there's 154 field partners. These are microfinance organizations on the Kiva platform. We're growing at about two to three a month. Um, and it's in 53 countries. But um, this organization in Sierra Leone, we were the first outside debt funder. Up till that point, they had only gotten um, uh, donation capital. And uh, essentially, we, because of their track record on Kiva, because this is, uh, as David talked about, you know, we, one of the problems is data and information about an organization. You can actually see the delinquency rates of these organizations on our website as you go down. Essentially, another commercial investor actually found real-time data um, on the Kiva website, we engaged in conversation with them, and they've just invested $150,000, which is a small amount of money, but is actually it's the second outside funder. And so, if we can start generating these pylons of other people coming in and being the first in risk capital in some of the riskier markets um, with these organizations, I think that's how we start breaking that cycle. Um, ideally, where where the markets haven't deepened yet in some of these post-conflict markets. Kiva can come in and the internet community can come in, be the first loss, uh, high, highly risk tolerant funders, ideally establish a track record for that organization in a very public setting, and then um, work with outside investors to come in and put in more risk capital on top of it. And then hopefully mature that organization and help, help strengthen it to the point where it can attract even more uh, capital and, and um, you know, be a long-lasting institution. So that's 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 one thing I get uh, pretty excited about. Um, let me back up. I, do you guys all? Would it be helpful for me to just talk about what Kiva is or anything like that? Does everyone here? Does everyone play around with the website for the most part? Is there anyone? Who, hey, um, is there anyone? Um, okay, good. So there's another thing that I'm really excited about when I talk about. Again, the internet community seems willing to. Because of the, the experience um, that is on this website, it generates an understanding. And when there's understanding you know, of Marie, 
then there's more empathy. And if there's more empathy, then there's kind of more risk tolerance or more patience with, with that $25 that I'm lending or $100 that I'm lending. And we're seeing some Kiva lenders put in over a million dollars into the system. But what they're doing is that they're distributing that million dollars in $25 chunks across hundreds of thousands of businesses or tens of thousands of businesses, essentially. And so what's happening is that we're now able to not only work in, in in places where the institutions might not be that strong or the country risk is very high, but we're able to, with with the uh, more mature microfinance uh, institutions, one of the big uh, opportunities is can microfinance be a platform? So what I mean by that is the, um, perhaps the most valuable thing that uh, Orwego, which is the organization that funds Marie here in Rwanda, um, has with Marie is that they have a relationship with her um, where they may visit her on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis to disperse and collect loan funds. Maybe they also uh, provide other financial services at this point such as savings or insurance, but they have this kind of last mile distribution network to some of the most far you know, remote places um, in the country. And with that distribution network, right, what else can you put down that pipeline? So for example, Vision Spring, um, you know, what they do so well with BRAC in East Africa is they're saying, okay, well, can, can we use the microfinance institution as a way to distribute eyeglasses and other things? And so one of the things that we'd like to do is with some of the more mature microfinance institutions on Kiva is have them use Kiva's risk capital or internet community's risk capital to fund things that they feel are too experimental, too risky to actually do using their commercial capital pool. One example of that is we just launched into student loans about a month ago. And I think the theory of change there is that right now, student loans, it's an unproven product in microfinance. We don't, here in the US, for example, student loan repayment rates are around 75%. Credit card repayment rates are around 94%. Student loans are highly subsidized here in the US. It's not a great commercial bet. But there's a huge need in the developing world. But because of the lack of repayment track record, local banks aren't getting into it. If local banks don't get into it, there's no repayment track record. Hence, you have a higher ed financing gap in the developing world. Could the internet community come in because they're more risk tolerant, more empathetic, more willing to kind of distribute risk a lot across a lot of people? Could we say, look, you know, at a Prospo in Peru, your first $100,000 that you raise on Kiva, you know, do it for your classic loan product of lending to entrepreneurs. But the next $50,000 that, you know, that, that you'll be allowed to raise, it needs to be in an innovation bucket. And you define what it is. But it should be something that you otherwise wouldn't do, ideally, um, like a student loan product. And then the interesting thing is, is if we look at the students, we posted, there's about, I don't know, 30 students on the website um, right now. Let's take a look at them really quick. the whole education category. Actually, personal. So, oh, it's, it's grown. So this is like kind of the between Kiva and Vitana, there's uh, probably, I don't know, two, less than 200 uh, student loans that have been posted on the internet at this point. And essentially, if this, if this group of students can demonstrate, I would say, a 95% plus repayment rate, um, and if we can demonstrate that in even a million or you know, $10 million of loan portfolio, then we think that demonstration effect to the local credit markets could be really powerful which would then generate kind of commercial capital, ideally, or maybe other like quasi-commercial funding sources to come in and experiment with this loan product. So you know, what we're hoping to do is, um, uh, again, just use the platform and the risk tolerance and the risk distribution to do things at the risk frontiers that otherwise would not happen um, in, in microfinance today. Um, let's see here. Let me, um, let me do this. I could talk in so many directions about Kiva, um, including like some of the things that we're really wrestling with at this point. But I'm just curious, like what's on people's minds? What would be interesting to talk about? Well, um, I, I, want, I wonder if you could talk about how you evaluate which microfinance lenders you hit. What are the 
characteristics. And I know, for example, Opportunity Fund here in Northern California seeks subsidy in order to carry out the transactions that need to happen alongside those loans. I imagine all of these guys are also looking at subsidies. So when you look at characteristics of viable partnerships, are you also looking at their ability to, to, to get other subsidized income in in order to coach the recipients appropriately, in, in order for the, you know, the, the, the borrowers to, to more effectively succeed? Sure. So the, um, there's there's a couple of questions in there. One is how do how does Kiva pick the microfinance field partners that you see on their website that are taking the photos of these borrowers and posting up their stories on our platform? Um, and then one of the criteria is their ability to get that subsidy. Exactly. And then I think and then what's the role of subsidy? Um, both Kiva subsidy and additional subsidy for these organizations um, in 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 helping uh, the clients that you see on the website. So on the first question, basically what we do is, it's similar to, to David's graph. We look at basically uh, the, the financial risk as well as the, the social impact. Um, and on the financial risk, there's a whole set of standard indicators there, right? Ranging from, do they have audited financials? Is it qualified or unqualified? You know, basically the strength of that, the board governance, um, uh, we look at the management team, we look at other investors that have participated in that MFI, we look at their portfolio at risk, their operational self-sufficiency. There's all those classic metrics that a typical investor in microfinance would look at. And then, based on that, we'll give it a one to five star risk rating score. Um, kind of like Morningstar gives a risk rating score to funds, right? So at a Prospero here, you can see that they got a field partner risk rating of four stars. And if you have a field partner risk rating of four stars, then you can raise $800,000 in a given year on Kiva. Okay, one, five stars, it's a million. You know, one star is 25,000. So it's kind of like a credit score. Now the other thing that we look at before we let you on our platform, and you know, right now we have 90 MFIs in the pipeline that are waiting to be evaluated. And we can only bring on again about two or three a month. That's what we have capacity for. Um, and, and the big thing, the other thing we're trying to figure out is what is the social impact of Kiva actually lending to this organization? And so um, one tool that we're using that we hope becomes a de facto standard in microfinance, it's called the Ceres tool. Um, it, the Ceres tool, um, it's 71 questions um, um, where you look at the uh, organization based on you know, targeting outreach. Um, so for example, what percent of their branches are rural? What percent of their clients are women? What percent of um, their clients are below the poverty line? Do they, what, what tool do they use to assess whether, where, um, where the client is uh, relative to that poverty line? Um, so there's a whole set of questions around that. There's a set of questions around products and services. So beyond the loan, do they offer savings, insurance? Um, there's um, uh, looking at their uh, social responsibilities, but particularly towards the clients. So what do they do around client protection? Uh, client uh, education, pricing transparency, that's a huge issue in microfinance. So there's a, there's a series of questions that the organization needs to go through. And we look at kind of the results there. We look at what's the impact of Kiva's funding, the risk tolerant funding, and it's all, also the visibility and the transparency we can give that organization to the rest of the investor community out there. And based on that, we decide whether or not we want to bring them on. Now, in terms of the role of subsidy, one thing that gets really exciting to me is for example, Eta Prospero in Peru, let's say that today, the way that they get, you know, they've raised $1.6 million for 6,000 entrepreneurs in their community in Peru on Kiva's platform. Let's say that today, where they get most of their money from is from a local bank, and the local bank charges them 13%. Um, and then they turn around and they lend that money out at 49%. Because, and, and lending it out at 49%, they're still unprofitable. They're negative 1.6% is their return on assets. So they're not even charging enough interest rates to cover their costs. This is Eta Prospero right now in Peru. Well, Kiva essentially reduces their cost of funds on these <coughs> 6,000 entrepreneurs from 13% to 0% because the internet community is lending out at 0% and we're passing it on. So the question is, is what are they doing with that 13% savings? Now, if you're an immature, not an immature, but a less mature uh, microfinance organization, what we want to do is help you strengthen your institution. That's priority number one. Because we want you to be around when we're all on our deathbeds. That's what, uh, one, of the, one of the best things we can do is create long-term viable 
financial service institutions. Now, as you become more mature and you're able to tap the, the, the capital markets, then what we want to do is use that spread to basically do other things for those clients. So ideally, it's wraparound services like business training, value chain support, healthcare. There's, there's a number of things, um, you know, what, what BRAC does with um, Vision, Vision Spring and you know, all the wraparound services, those are cost centers. Citibank today doesn't actually you know, go around and kind of give you training and you know, help you with neonatal education or anything like that. But the organizations on Kiva actually do. And so that's where some of that spread, that 13% will go, essentially. Um, and, and one of the things that we lack right now that we want to get better at is a stronger measurement and evaluation of tracking where that subsidy is actually going. Because how do we know that it's really going there versus buying a new Mercedes S-Class for the executive director? That's, that's, that's the thing that we got to get better and better at at Kiva. Um, other questions? Consider, or maybe you have already uh, partnering with microfinance uh, mortgage lenders, and uh, if you ever plan to separate question, but if you ever plan to uh, provide a rate to your internet lenders. So on the first question, um, housing um, is a, is a category, and I guess there's four nearly five thousand housing loans on the website. So what we're seeing is these microfinance institutions. Um, are, you know, they have many different products, including the ho housing loans. The housing loans tend to get funded at a slower rate in terms of dollars raised per hour than um, the, uh, I guess, productive loans. Um, although the truth is, is that, you know, an expansion of the room in the house can actually fuel the productivity of that household. So um, we're trying to make that connection better for the internet community to understand why it's so important to invest in the house. Um, on the second question, would we let, ever let the in average person who's making a loan on the Kiva platform get a non-zero rate of return? And right now, there's no plan to do that. The, the re, the, there's, there's several reasons why there's no plans to do that. Um, primarily, regulatory complexity. It's, it, it, I mean, the fact that Kiva, it's like Wikipedia. Wikipedia, for the longest time, had four employees, right? Now they're up to, I think, 22. And you know, it's one of the top 10 sites on the internet. It's an internet public good. Kiva has so few employees to the surface area that it covers that complexity would kill the model. It really would. I mean, the regulatory complexity, not only with the SEC in the US, but like dealing with the FSA in the UK and you know, European regulations and like SSNs and 1099s. And, and fundamentally, I don't think that's what my cousin who's making a loan on Kiva is looking for right now. I think what they're looking for is actually a deeper connective experience and a sense of impact and a feedback loop at the end of the loan saying, what happened? Um, and we're, we still got a lot of ground to cover there. So I think for now, um, we're, we're, we're not going to really try to explore the hypothesis of giving people a rate of return um, just because it's, it explodes the complexity um, and, and it could actually damage the brand. Do, what do you guys think? Do you think that's unwise? Do you think we should be more aggressive about exploring that hypothesis? No, I, I think that's right. I mean, one of the things you said, uh, to Mark from the book, but one of the things that I think you said earlier about that third dimension is exactly that, right? And I think you see it with Kickstarter, you see it with a whole bunch of other things where the internet community is expressing this desire to be more connected to these things. And what it means is it changes or, or in some ways, nicely, if in your example, moves out of the way the complexities of tax law, the complexity of all the regulatory stuff around this. And that, that lets us have a new kind of social venture and also, as individuals, a new way of engaging that's much more agile now and can do what you guys are So I think you're right. And to see it in that context as opposed to the traditional you know, financial or philanthropic context. Yeah, I think there's this broad hypothesis. So there's an amazing book um, that's come out. It's called Portfolios of the Poor. And what they did to basically, um, they, they actually had uh, um, uh, um, households in South Africa, um, I think it was India, and then in one other country basically do financial diaries looking at cash flows in and out of the house. And that's really difficult. A lot of this data had not really existed in this public, like a, a real rigorous analysis. And it turns out the biggest source of funds for the poor are actually friends and family. And you know, if you look at entrepreneurs here, you know, besides maybe Visa and MasterCard being our biggest backers, it's probably friends and family. And so one hypothesis that I think we should stay really focused on is how does like, me lending you to you, Mark, essentially, you know, if we go out to lunch, I spot you 25 bucks because you didn't have your wallet, I'm not going to charge you a rate of return, 
but you know, next time we go to lunch, you pay me back and we have a personal connection. That personal connection actually changes the game. And if we can deepen the personal connection between you and that person across the planet, I actually think that people are going to really, but, but there's still an accountability with the loan. There's still information when you get repaid. And that's what people are really craving is that feedback loop. I think there's a lot more money that we could actually tap into and grow much faster. To put Kiva's growth in context right now, um, um, it took us uh, about uh, 15 months to raise the first $1 million. Now we do it every six days on the platform. Um, we're at $160 million today. We're targeting a $1 billion in five years and break even as a social enterprise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, sorry. Sure. Their constraints and the constraints that are in the marketplace protecting the kind of scale of the capital. So, um, let me tell you, uh, key, um, if we could break Kiva into two phases, let's say the early phase when um, there was uh, just as much probability that it wouldn't exist as, as the, the, the luck and serendipity that's happened that has allowed us to scale. A big part of that is when Draper Richards Foundation came in, they were our first institutional donor. Um, we, Matt and I, were running around Silicon Valley. We're horrendous fundraisers. I don't know. Like, <laughs> and um, we had uh, Matt's parents put money into it um, as a donation. Um, and uh, a guy from Vegas put money into it. And that, that was our, <laughs> we were on a $22 a month server plan. But more than that, we started have, we had a staff of seven. They were all volunteers. And we had to start getting people health care. So um, we basically had about a month of payroll left in October of 2007, and a few things happened. Um, one, uh, we, uh, we got approved for the Draper Richards grant, so we knew that $300,000 over three years was going to come. So immediately, it kind of changed our, our notion of scale. Two, that month was really serendipitous because Mohammed Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize, which overnight made microcredit a kitchen paper word. When you type microcredit into Google, Kiva came up, all of a sudden our site traffic doubled. And then three, we were on PBS Frontline World, which was almost like a, a big Series A injection um, because there's a lot of site traffic. And the way we make money on Kiva, the, the, what covers 70% of the bills is, is essentially this. When you make a loan, when you hit lend $25, um, you'll see that, and you go to my basket, you'll see that we have basically an optional donation to cover Kiva's operational costs. And it's an additional 15% tip, essentially, that we suggest. And um, unlike most restaurants in America where people do tip 15%, usually um, about half people choose to not tip us at all because they don't want to eat into their principal. And then the rest tip us about 15%. So we're making, on average, uh, 7 7.5% um, for every dollar that's rolling through the system. To run Kiva, it's costing us 10 cents. Uh, or 10 percent, so we have kind of a three cent gap. That three cent gap right now is being covered by a, a, a set of foundations. And what we predict, essentially, and, and so to go into our second phase, is for the next five years, where we'd like to get to is control our expenses, get better and better at you know engaging more volunteers, getting a lot more leverage out of the software, so that we can bring our cost down from 10 cents on a dollar to about eight cents on a dollar, and to get our revenues up to about eight cents. Um, and over the course of five years, if we can do that, we need, we need about $15 million to raise to get us to that point of break even at scale. And the scale number we're trying to target is about a billion dollars in loans. And so as you look out at trying to raise this $15 million, is the market, the intermediation, social intermediation market sufficiently robust to handle this kind of investment? Or are you going to do that? You know, the, I've been a little disappointed um, in that. I've been really inspired by what Vision Spring's been able to do, and I, and I hear about other kind of scaling social enterprises that do a growth capital campaign. And I'm sure, um, Jordan, I don't know if you talked about that earlier today. Do you want to just explain what you guys did? Well, in, in a nutshell, we started a growth capital campaign to raise unrestricted growth capital. 
Um, and you know, we, we were finding ourselves spending way more, too much time raising $10,000 for the time all the time. So we created a $5 million growth capital campaign that we would raise a million dollar units, divisible by quarter units, uh, and that way it enabled us to attract donors who were willing to give larger sums of money that were totally unrestricted and that they all bought into the same reporting requirements. So that one donor didn't have X report, the other donor had Y report. So it ended up saving us a lot of time in terms of both fundraising and reporting to a syndicate of investors who were really interested in seeing our model scale. Um, I, I would say that it's been quite successful. We, we, we didn't close the round. We reached about 3.5 million of the five to date. Uh, but it has helped in many ways. Uh, it's not the streaming success, but it was something that definitely took us from where we were to a whole different level. So what we, you know, inspired by stories like that, um, Kiva said, look, you know, we seem to have a model that people say, okay, it's working. We really want to hit it C scale, and we want to hit you, we want to see you through self-sufficiency that, so that we don't have to keep asking for money. Um, and we've had some success in raising that, some part of that 15 million. Um, we've raised about maybe seven of that we have commitments. But I would think that this, like, it should be easier. Because we should not be spending our time. I, I mean, you know, there's no return. I, I don't know if we're not packaging it right or what, but like, it it should be faster. Probably it's hard to raise money. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, this is you know what we're doing is we're taking away from the potential impact here. Because this thing is working, we should be like we should not be fundraising in long conversations, having cultivation lunches. Quite honestly, it's just really inefficient. Colonel, have you tested suggesting an 18 percent tip rather than a 15? Yeah. You know, what we're, what we're seeing is, is we, we're trying to find the balance between our community becoming really upset with us. So we're really, we started at 10%, and then we ratcheted up to 15, essentially, and we're, every day we get about 20 people writing in upset. So we're trying to figure out at what point does a brand become actually, uh, does the brand lose its um, luster, you know? And we sign up about uh, 350 people a day, so it's almost 10%. You know, of people. One of yeah. my students, when I talk about your business model, because we interviewed your CFO for our project, um, said, "Why aren't you charging the MFIs a, a small percentage? This is an, an institution base who has a vested interest in in a relationship with you. Why not?" Yeah, the question was, "Why don't we just charge the microfinance institutions?" Um, the primary reason is that Kiva on the ground, we believe that if we keep it at zero percent interest, um, it. It, right now, we still sometimes run out of loans on our site. And so even at 0% interest, we're hitting market, e market equilibrium. So if we're to charge 3% interest, we might actually have less microfinance organizations using it. Or the organizations that could actually you know, afford it, which might not be the organizations that we want to work with. Uh, yeah, we think that, we think that you know, there's, there's an elegance to just keeping it at zero and then um, just trying to stay lean at this point. Also, there's there's a bunch of tax withholding issues and regulatory complexity that you know we just got a general counsel about a year ago to help us sort through these kind of things. I have a question. For sure. So I I appreciated the pictures you had of the, <laughs> of the competition because actually that's something that I don't know what was competition among the essentially the social entrepreneurs and the nonprofit. That's a piece of this world that's really misunderstood. Yeah. So everyone feels like, oh, I'm going to be a social entrepreneur. I'm going to go out and create a new NGO. And I think I heard that there are 30,000 nonprofits in Durham, which um, if that's true, I mean, that's, that's not I hope that's not true. But <laughs> I think that's, that's what uh, one of your yeah. colleagues mentioned to me. But you know, so there's, there's a preponderance of yeah. these kind of one man or one woman shops. And the market is not that efficient. Right. Because it doesn't take that much to stay in business, if you will. Right. So I would encourage you to go back to the, <laughs> the drawing Go back to the math. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I just, I, I think that um, we don't think about competition within the nonprofit or social entrepreneurial space in the same way that we do, and maybe we should. Well, I think that's an interesting point, and, and, and this was one of the things I, I was 
I was trying to hint at when I said that one of the big payoffs here is kind of breaking the link between the scale of the individual organization and the scale of the social mission that it's, that, that it's uh, achieving. Because you can imagine that if you have a lot of competition amongst uh, social entrepreneurs, that the, that the, um, the ones that, that aren't efficient at delivering social impact well, will be forced to close. And then what will happen? Well, maybe those people will, will kind of get folded into the organizations that are expanding and succeeding. And so that can be a force that, 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 that promotes the amount of social impact out there through kind of the churning process that we've, we, we've come to accept in the world of commercial venture uh, in entrepreneurship as part of life and an exciting part of life. Yeah, I'm going back to, to the interest rate uh, issue. I'm still, to be quite honest, not 100% convinced with your answer of why not charging the MFI. Yeah. Um, from the perspective that you definitely want to create the subsidy at 13% for the other services that, that they are bringing. But at some point, um, to really create a market, these institutions have to become financially sustainable. And at that time, perhaps that could be the moment for you to charge some sort of percentage. I'm, I'm just kind of wanting to probe that a little bit more. It's a great question. I mean, you know, even as I think about it, I'm like, I wonder what if, if, if we're really kind of optimizing the revenue at this stage. Um, the, here's some of the numbers behind it. Um, one is, although there's a long line of MFIs that are willing to get onto the Kiva platform, what we're finding is, is that the compliance, for example, um, um, only 30% of the loans that come to term on our website will there be an actual feedback loop of a, an, a progress update posted. So we have low compliance from our microfinance institutions because it is actually, it's not 0% interest capital. There's two costs. One is, you know, there's a lot of administrative work of taking the photos, getting your loan officers, cameras, you know, gathering this data. Now, once you get operating efficiencies, we estimate it to be pretty cheap, but there's that cost and we're still not getting our current model working. And if you don't get our current model, if our lenders don't get an update on how the business performed or did not perform, um, they become uh, disengaged. And today we have uh, it's something like 18 to 20 million dollars just sitting in Kiva accounts stagnant that is not being relent because people you know aren't, aren't getting the, the, the feedback mechanism that makes Kiva you know that, that, that's the potential. So right now we're trying to actually create more cost at the MFI level in terms of them reporting and creating a more compelling set of updates. That's the bigger priority to keep the lender base engaged. That's, that's, that's one of the big things. But I think longer term, it's something interesting to look at. Also, because the long term dynamics of our model is as people relend their money in Kiva, they tend to not want to tip us. Because let's say you put $100 into the system, the first time through, you're going to tip us 15%. But then when you get $100 paid back, you kind of want to just relend that all to the port. You never, you know, no one wants to pay for overhead. And so what we're seeing is, is that our take rate on our lenders is going down to some degree. So we need to figure out either how to get more efficient or find new revenue streams. And I think that might be something we should open up. So it's a good question. So I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, if I go on this site and donate money, you're going to charge my Visa card or my MasterCard. Well, why don't you get them to pony up some money? Well, I know, yeah. but, but I mean, uh, why, why don't you structure the deal? Why don't you, you know, do it on a deal flow basis so that every, you know, every hundred dollars coming in off a Visa card gets a gets a write back to you? Okay. Well, so um, <laughs> so so well, maybe just, you do. Or... Yeah. So just to explain this, one thing that has actually enabled the Kiva model is that we have this sweetheart deal with PayPal, and. Um, um, PayPal basically gives us free payment processing, um, which basically there's no variable cost of the dollars going back and forth in the system. If there was 3% tax on the way in, which is a credit card fee, and then 3% tax on the way out, right, you know, to get your money out, all of a sudden we'd have negative six cents of a new cost on top of the 10 cents. It would be not model crushing, but it wouldn't be good. So we're already getting it for free. But the thing that what I'm learning is that it's easy for PayPal to give it free, but no company wants to sign up to sustainably actually add more money onto their books to pay for us. So this is why we're trying to raise it from hundreds of thousands of people and in little chunks. But Visa did just give you a million 
Yeah, and then this this that's week, yeah, yeah. So a, thanks for taking. So this week, uh, uh, Visa just gave us a million dollars uh, to expand awareness of microfinance in the U.S. So what we've just done on our website is um, what we're seeing is that there's 20 million small businesses in the U.S. that are underserved by the current uh, financial system. Um, and today, the microfinance uh, organizations in the U.S. have reached about 120,000 people. So small penetration, big problem. Um, we think that one of the gaining factors is small businesses, so like a home daycare center, right, that has a thin credit file or doesn't really have a credit score. They can't get commercial credit. They, they don't want a $50,000 loan. They just need $10,000. Um, they don't know what's out there in the community. So what Kiva and Visa is trying to do is actually build a lot more awareness. So we've created an online portal for small businesses to come to our website. Since we're already getting 1.5 million people a month coming to the site, where they can learn about how to apply for a microfinance loan. So that's a big part of that partnership. Uh, I was wondering, do you have a sort of standard process for collections if people are delinquent or fail to pay on the, on the partner side? And do you share best practices among them? Yeah, um, so uh, the collections are done by local field partners on the ground, all independent organizations from Kiva. But part of our due diligence and monitoring on them is to look at basically there's a set of six client protection principles. Um, and one of them looks at kind of the ethics of the collection practice, pricing transparency, kind of a number of other factors that um, I think we're, we get the benefit of here in the US, for example. Um, and right now, um, you know, while we're chasing this issue down, um, uh, if we find any serious infractions, that's grounds for pausing or basically closing the relationship. Um, we really want to send a strong message around client protection, um, especially in light of just you know what you're hearing about in India, and I mean it's a big reputational issue for the industry. So I think what we have here is a great example of um, an organization that has taken an innovation around data, right? What can you provide back to an individual to motivate them to do something? And you've been able to scale incredibly and create a whole new layer of capital in the marketplace. Um, and as you said, we're talking about you know a, a much more risk-friendly layer in many ways that can enable other things to get done. So relates your work to your work, and I, we're really pleased to have had you both talk about it. Thanks. Thanks. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.